Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sterling Live. My name is Caitlin Brower. I am Sterling's social media manager. Sterling Live is our weekly live series where we come to you live streaming on our Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube accounts. We have great guests for you every single week, and I'm so excited to be with the two guests above me right now, and I'll go ahead and I'll get into introducing them, introducing the topic, but we have a great, great show for you all today, so thank you for joining us. Without further ado, I will introduce our guests. So up here, you can see we have Ken Schnee. He is our general manager of technology, media, entertainment, and hospitality at Sterling. And we also have over here, we have Ben Monez. He's the CEO and founder of Fama. So thank you both for joining me today. Um, I want to give you two a little bit to uh, formally introduce yourselves to our audience. Just give them a little little insight into who you guys are, what you guys do. Um, so Ken, we can start with you. Can you introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, absolutely, Caitlin. As Caitlin mentioned, I am the general manager of tech, media, entertainment, hospitality. Uh, here at Sterling, we do uniquely focus on verticals. I've been within the screening industry specifically for over 12 years now and really look forward today uh, using that expertise in conversation with Ben to specifically focus on our topic today. So look forward to the discussion. Please ask away and try and stump us throughout. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be the theme. Let's stump these two. And Ben, can you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Ben. I'm the CEO and founder of Fama. We're the world's uh, largest social media screening company. Sterling partner now for uh, coming on just about three years. Uh, excited to be here on the LinkedIn Live and talking social media screening. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I do want to remind our audience real quick across Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, if you are watching live, you can ask us questions at any time. Just go into the comment section on each of these platforms and submit your questions. And I will get them over to Ken and Ben as I see fit throughout the show. So as mentioned briefly before, our topic today is the rise of social media screening and a changing hiring process. So let's go ahead and get right into it because I know right away we have to do an overview. We got to talk about social media screening. What is it? All of that good stuff behind it. So Ben, I'm coming to you first with our first question. Basic question. What is social media screening? Yeah, sure. So what it isn't, it's not a score. It's not a <laughs> thumbs up or a thumbs down. It's not a yes or a no. Instead, social media screening is a technology that allows a business to bring in insights from the publicly available web about candidates, their words, their actions that might have an impact on the brand that they're building when they come and join a company, the culture that they're contributing to. So social media screening is really a way to leverage the online record and to identify the sorts of things for employers that are relevant towards one, building a great brand or building a great workforce. And keeping out all of the dog pictures, food check-ins, all the irrelevant content on social media to hiring managers. Not uh, the dog social... pictures? No, no, no <laughs> dog pics, nothing <laughs> like that as much as my, my social is littered with that. Um, <laughs> no, this is really about identifying, you know, the, the sorts of incongruencies, the uh, sorts of online behaviors that might be contributing if a new person comes in to a customer seeing that and saying, oh my gosh, you know, is that type of person I want to buy from? Is that what my rep looks like? You know, is that really the person who I, I want to be engaging with? Or two, if you're thinking about joining a company, it's, you know, how do I ensure the people that I'm hiring, bringing in are going to be contributing to building a great culture rather than taking away from it? So yeah, this is not like a 1984 scoring. We're making recommendations on people mm -hmm. instead, really allowing hiring managers to bring insights from the public web uh, into their pre-employment screening workflow in a FCRA, EPOC compliant fashion. So touching more upon that, that workflow and the hiring process, how would you um, explain how this fits into the entire hiring process? Sure. So I wouldn't say it's a, a replacement for, you know, background checks or, you know, other types of, uh, you know, verifications, for example, but instead very complimentary. So, um, you know, we look today at sort of what are the things that, you know, modern customers, modern employers care about? What are the, you know, sorts of candidate behaviors that make a great business. And, you know, certainly I think the, uh, you know, looking at criminal convictions and ensuring that a person went to the school they said they went to or has a license they say that they have are all critical pieces towards building trust with the candidate when they come in. But 
this broader question of how do I ensure this person is a fit? How do I ensure, again, this mm -hmm. person is going to, in every interaction with our clients, uphold our brand values, the things that make us go forward, or conversely, in interactions with other employees inside of the company, how do I ensure that these people, again, are going to be contributive? So, you know, it, it's really uh, fitting into, I think, what modern customers and modern employees of companies are asking of the businesses that they buy from or join respectively. And I think, you know, we're starting to see more adoption. And I know we'll talk about it a little bit because of, you know, fair chance and the overall mm -hmm. uh, restriction, I think, of you know, information that employers have access to when they're making a hiring decision in the pre-employment screening phase. So a lot of companies are saying, well, look, you know, if my, you know, uh, customers or my employees don't care about a low-level marijuana conviction from six years ago, why are we looking at that as part of the pre-employment screening process? Mm -hmm. And in that vacuum, I think a lot of companies are saying, all right, well, we still need to make sure it's never been more important to make sure we have the right person internally. So companies are turning to tools like social media screening, uh, you know, as a way to kind of fill that gap. So a lot about like the cultural fit and making sure that, you know, like, you know, you had mentioned, you know, up and upholding your company values, things like that. So very interesting for sure. So Ken, I'm going to come over to you with the next question, because uh, I do want to get a better understanding of how Fama and Sterling, you know, work together. So um, can you further explain our partnership and, you know, how we do work together for very diligent uh, social media screening? Yeah, so I I think the first thing that comes to mind when you incorporate social media screening into your background screening or onboarding process, it's critical that it becomes as seamless as everything else you're doing, the criminal, mm -hmm. the drug testing, any of the various verifications. And one thing that we developed in choosing Fama, the leading social media provider, is we built a extremely configurable solution. Uh, we went above and beyond what the industry standards were for integration with Fama so that the solution is completely configurable. I think you will hear Ben talk a lot about uh, how you can really hone in on exactly what you're looking for. I, I know Ben mentioned it, you didn't want the dog pictures, but, but maybe, <laughs> Maybe you do, uh, but the, the, the truth is we've allowed our solution to be seamless in that process. So while it's powered by Fama, uh, throughout the end-to-end -end solution, you wouldn't know it because all of the selections that you make and all of the integrations that you deploy with us seamlessly integrate end-to-end -end and allow you to use the solution mm -hmm. as if it's one of the products with it. That's great. So Ben, it really seems like social media screening is rapidly growing in 2021. So can you let our no, uh, audience know as to why it is growing so quickly right now? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, we uh, just from an overall growth standpoint, we've seen uh, for same clients, we ran the same amount of checks in August of this year as we ran in the entire fourth quarter of last year. So I know we're wow. still in kind of the post COVID bump, but yeah, we have just seen rapid expansion and adoption, you know, of social media screening really over the past, I would say, 18 months or so, kind of, you know, right post pandemic when that whole business kicked off. But, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a broader, I think, kind of transition to us spending, you know, I know Ken will talk a little bit about the remote work piece here in a, in a few moments, but a lot of us are spending more time online, I think, living out our identities on the internet as opposed to in physical spaces mm -hmm. like we might have pre-pandemic. I think you see a rising uh, you know, trend in the millennial workforce as well, Gen Z getting into the workforce, but very quickly here, millennials becoming the largest segment, certainly in corporate America, um, all of which, you know, these people came up under uh, you know, the, the first Facebook accounts in 2004, 2005, right? Twitter coming out in 2009. So these social networks very much became a uh, uh, big part of these people's identities and the fabric of who they are and employers in the same way that they look at your experience, they look at your credentials. Some may look at the university you went to, for example, they're starting to look at that character as evidence through the online record. And I think you saw this kind of tipping of the scales with COVID uh, where people are, again, spending more time online. There's this ever-increasing data lake to get access into. And then at the same time, you have the month of April being fair chance month, you know, or, or second chance month, excuse me, that, you know, President Biden, you know, proclaimed as a way to reintegrate, you know, previous offenders back into the workforce to help solve 
this massive labor shortage that mm-hmm. we're dealing with right now. And, you know, while I'm, I'm personally in, in very strong support of Fair Chance, I align with a lot of the data that suggests that, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable going to businesses and shopping at companies where, you know, there are previous offenders working in the workplace, you know, I'm comfortable joining a business, you know, that uh, we hire, you know, people in our company, right, from a fair chance standpoint, those are not things that we hold very closely, you know, and say, oh, well, we're not going to do that. You know, we think it's the right thing to do for a range of reasons. But, you know, at the end of the day, employers still need to make an informed decision about who they're hiring and who they're Mm -hmm. bringing on board, you know, while the second chance, the fair chance movement, I think, is a necessary and critical way to bolster the workforce and a lot of the job applications and the job shortages that we're facing right now. It doesn't mean that employers or hiring managers or HR or talent acquisition is off the hook. You know, right. if you let somebody into your organization, even if, you know, fair chance law might be changing the types of resources and the types of archetypes and data that you have access to. You still need to ensure, again, in today's day and age where consumers are more connected than ever before, when they're able to start up, you know, a Twitter boycott overnight of a company, (laughs) it has never been more important to make sure that the people that you bring on board are reflective, again, of those brand values that drive your company forward. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, in a hyper competitive market, the great resignation, people leaving um, on a regular basis now, really balancing their, their home. Uh, work balance that you know sort of balance we're all trying to strike I think on a on a regular basis you know they're gonna leave you know if it's a toxic work environment 54 percent of employer of employees excuse me uh, said they would leave a job in a toxic work environment right mm-hmm. so if you're creating an environment that is you know rife with intolerance or threats or people harassing each other you're not going to be there so it's kind of this weird, liminal space and in between the talent acquisition, shared services, the background screening profession, uh, professionals inside of the companies that we work with, they're caught in this, okay, my my customer, meaning the business, they care about different stuff. They don't care as much about the low-level marijuana conviction as much as is this person posting and acting in a racist way online that's going to alienate right. my customers or alienate my employees mm-hmm. from the company already. So I think you're starting to see and this is just a hypothesis. I think we need a few more more months of data to bear this out. But I think you're starting to see companies turn to different data types and different types of insights about people just because, you know, certain types of checks might not matter as much anymore to mm-hmm. customers and employees. But that doesn't mean that, like, the market is giving them, a, you know, a fair, a clear, a clear pass to say, yeah, hire whoever you want. It doesn't really matter. So it's kind of this weird, you know, balance and, and I think challenge that, our customers are caught in, which is like, okay, well, I still don't have a second. I don't have a second chance if I miss something. So how do right. I make sure, you know, that that I'm bringing the right people in? So it's a it's an interesting challenge, and I think you're seeing companies turn uh, to different record types. And I think, you know, that's another reason we're seeing identity exploding as much as it is as it is right now. And I know that's a big priority for Sterling as of late. I was going to say, we might know a thing or two about that, but um, you're, you're absolutely correct with, you know, how interesting this shift is um, and kind of looking at new data sources and everything like that. And even just kind of the explosion of people getting online, like you had mentioned early on in your answer there, because even things like this, we're sitting on a live stream now, the amount of live streams I see on a weekly basis, these episodic, you know, shows that are going on new podcasts, things like that. So it's what you said, people are really coming into this virtual reality and making a new identity for themselves. So definitely areas that companies need to look at for sure, because as we go out and express ourselves, you need to make sure that it fits back in with, again, like we had mentioned, company values, cultural fit, everything like that. So again, very interesting shift for sure. Let's keep the conversation going on shifts because Let's talk about the remote work environment, because that has been a huge shift over the past year or so for many, many people around the world, Um, you know, especially for the three of us. I know we're all clearly in our our homes right now, so we are remote. Um, So, Ken, I have a ton of questions for you. Ben, obviously, feel free to chime in throughout here. Um, But let's talk about social media screening in a remote world. So, Ken, my first question for you is, you know, how has social media screening changed in this uh, remote work environment that we're in? Yeah, so Ben talked a little bit about the growth of social media. And at Sterling, we're seeing uh, at least three times the the growth in 
social media screening that we saw uh, just a year and a half ago. So I'm going to attribute a, a lot of that to the work from home. But the first aspect of it is definitely the dynamic nature of social media screening. So within our vertical, uh, media tends to be one of the areas where there's been a big investment. And that's because obviously, if you're a big media outlet, you have a, a pretty big concern about the folks that you're potentially putting on TV and, and the background that they serve. But now that there is this shift to remote work, social media becomes even more important. And mm -hmm. why you might ask, there's a lot of answers to this question, but the one that I'll focus in on is before the world was remote, if I was gonna go work at Fama, it's likely that Ben and I at some point would sit down with each other and he would get to see some signals that I make that, that are hard to see. Maybe my hand signals that you can't see on the video chat that we're on right now, or my legs that are bouncing up and down when I'm making statements. So these signals that help you to really understand a person's character as you're interviewing them and you learn a lot, right? Maybe mm -hmm. you can get a sense of things that they might not be telling the truth about or things that you know, are a little bit dark or gray when, when you're investigating. And so now the big question is, how do I get to know this person in the same way or even better than I could have when I was interviewing them before? And right now, more than 84% of the workforce utilizes social media in some way. So as Ben mentioned, the data set that we're looking at is now changing. I don't need to see you bouncing your leg up and down when you're talking about uh, guns. All I need to do is a thorough search of your social media profile, and I'll get a pretty good understanding on you know, the policies and, and what you believe in with regards to certain certain predisposed uh, settings that I put in the system. So, so really, it, it gives me a window into what I couldn't see before mm -hmm. and now really broadens the spectrum that I have on somebody that I'm hiring remotely and won't likely have the opportunity to sit down with face to face. No. So do you see the increase then just for remote employees or what about, you know, some organizations that are going back into the office? You know, is that need still going to be there? You know that you, you bring up a great question because I focused a lot on the fact that maybe you won't ever see the person. But I think really what this did is just open the eyes to the expansive data that's out there. So before yeah. you had that interview and you were closed into what you got in that interview. Then we had the unfortunate outcome of COVID that forced everybody home and social media was on the rise. And we learned that there's all this additional data available on individuals. And so now with the combination of both, we're now able to broaden that view. And as Ben mentioned, we, you only get one chance to make a decision. Uh, second chance is, is offered mm -hmm. and, and fair chance is, is absolutely necessary from a candidate standpoint, but it's essential that as a business, you make the right choice the first time and having all the available information at your fingertips really gives you the ability to do that. Yeah, and the only thing I would add, you know, I was thinking, Ken, about, uh, some of the first job interviews I went on, I remember I had a boss who I eventually learned that this was an interview technique, but I remember interviewing for a job and, and he said to me, he said, hey, you know, on the way in, uh, final interview, I was interviewing for a tech job. I, I ended up getting it and it was an okay, I, I didn't love it, you know, it was, it was a good job. Shout out to my boss, my old boss, <laughs> if, you are, if you're listening and hear this story. Him and I became friends, really close friends afterwards, so it's all good. But um, on the way to the interview, like probably an hour before I leave my house and, you know, I have my resume printed out on a nice paper. I have my like blazer on my nice shirt, you know, I was doing my nice shoes, doing the whole thing, trying to present well to your point and communicate the sorts of values and confidence that this person would then look at when I came into the organization calls me and he says, Hey, can you stop at CVS on the way in? My wife ran out of baby formula. Um, and here's the brand that we like. And I was kind of taken aback. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, I got this job interview and, and this guy wants me to, to pick up something for, you know, baby formula for his wife. And I said, all right, well, 
look, I want the job. I want to do it. I find out after the fact, you know, that he, you know, was saying to me, oh, look, well, I just wanted to see how charitable you were. If you could do me a favor, like if this was something you'd be willing to step outside of, you know, what I told you to do, maybe push yourself a little bit, do something unpredictable that was unprepared, you know, and that was just his way of, of assessing that question, right. Of that, like, character question of, of will this person fit because so many of us when we hire we're trying to figure out it's easy to tell if someone has the experience like do you know how to use excel or not right. you know and then the next question is like what about the edges what happens outside of you know a person's expertise their credentials their education um, and i think you know we lost that with the transition to the remote work environment. Like the example of picking up baby form is just a small thing, but mm -hmm. you know, everything from like the handshake to eye contact to, you know, a person's ability to, you know, throw them a surprise question and how they handle that in a job interview, for example, and you can kind of see, you know, the sweat start pouring down their forehead <laughs> and how they react to that, right? You know, those are all interview techniques that I think a lot of employers, to your point, were kind of saying, look, like, what do we do now? And, and while I while I love you know obviously social media screening as a as a solve for that question and a and a way to fill that gap, there are so many different factors I think that have contributed to the rise. Whether it's remote work, fair chance, and because the environments that we're in of hiring and the information we're using and not using are so interdependent, and there are so many systems that kind of work as one together. Whether it's like talent assessments or pre-employment screening or the in-person interview or the social interview that when you take that all away, introduce a pandemic, introduce a labor shortage, introduce this explosion of social media, every, all the scales just get tilted, you know, and, and it's this sort of effect where we come out on the other side and, and we jump on live streams and try and explain like, how did this happen? Where are we right now? But the fact is, you know, it's, we went through a massive shift over the past year just mm -hmm. a massive shift in the way that we hire and the way that we work and one that we're still going through right now. You know, I, I don't think there's a consensus, for example, about the return to work and all that and when we're going to, if we're ever going to go back to a full nine to five in the office. So yeah, it's, it's so interesting to try and play Monday morning quarterback on a situation that we're still living through right now because so many of the changes that have happened since, you know, March of last year have remained consistent. So Definitely. So I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to start focusing specific to um, some industries. So, you know, maybe some of our uh, listeners are, you know, into these industries and want to make sure how does it directly tie to what they're doing on a day to day basis. So, uh, Ben, you're going to keep talking because I'm coming to you first for this one. Um, so how does, you know, how do different industries affect, you know, these types of social media ser uh, searches? And then also, given that we are with Ken from his specific vertical, I would love to know if you can touch on the technology industry and the entertainment industry. Sure. You know, it's it, the, the, I think the rise of social media screening through an industry specific lens. We've always talked about it as, you know, companies that have high revenue per employee, companies that have employees that, you know, are customer facing that tend to move the needle, meaning that people aren't just, you know, behind a, a paper wall, you know, pressing a button, but people are actually engaging with their clients on a day to day basis and driving the brand forward. So highly compliant, highly regulated industry. Uh, people with access to sensitive manufacturing, sensitive information systems. Effectively, when you have to invest more time and money to make sure the person coming in is the right person for uh, for the org through that kind of brand and and cultural lens that we spoke through. But you know, with tech in particular, tech has always been one of the fastest adopting verticals of Fama and one of the largest, I would say, and earliest uh, adopters of our solution. And I think part of the rise as of late is our industry, and I can speak from experience, you know, being uh, uh, leading a tech company right now, it is hard to hire, it is hard to keep people, it is extremely difficult to ensure that you're building not just, you know, a, a great brand in the eyes of your client, but a great culture. So I think a lot of companies are now saying, all right, you know, the, the, the racial justice protests of last summer, you know, we wrote the letter, we made the black square on Instagram, but what are we doing now? Mm -hmm. How are we as an industry, especially one that's hyper competitive in technology, putting our money where, where our mouth is and actually layering in the filters from a pre-employment screen standpoint that are going to enable us to hire people who are reflective of the values that we proclaimed, you know, so greatly last year into this year. So 
I think industries that are hyper competitive that look at employee churn and turnover as a risk and the new people coming in as being formative and helping develop, you know, that company rather than detract from it. Uh, that's one piece of it. But two, you know, in entertainment specifically, on-air talent, influencers, you're seeing a huge movement right now from, uh, call it direct or, you know, performance-based advertising for large brands and companies, uh, especially moving into content and, you know, influencers. So mm -hmm. influencers are, are working with brands now and those brands have to ensure brand safety. You don't, you know, there are if you just Google influencer racist tweet, you know, you'll see a, a litany of results yeah. of, you know, influencers that were brought on to represent a, ba a brand. And then, you know, their uh, dirty laundry from the past comes out. The customers of that brand are like, wait, what? Like, this is the guy? Like, this is the guy you're going to have to represent the brand after? He said this two years ago and you didn't catch that? So, yeah. you know, on your talent and influencers, I think you're you're always going to see an interest in taking a closer look and ensuring these people are reflect through the guys, the organization or the brand. But, you know, tech more generally has just been something I think for a long time as a way to retain talent and be competitive in, you know, who you hire and how you hire to make sure the person coming in is not going to be this like seed of toxicity in an organization because the data as I shared is out there, you know, good employees are 50% more likely to quit in a toxic work environment, mm -hmm. right? Productivity goes down in a toxic work environment. These are not just like hypotheses that we make up to, right. to try and, you know, sell the solution. These are facts. These are like data from the Harvard Business Review and partnership with Cornerstone On Demand landmark study from a few years ago. So yeah, we uh, we, we see a lot in Ken's, in Ken's industry, which is probably why we're here on this live stream. It's <laughs> <laughs> definitely why we're here. No, but yeah, it, it's also, so interesting to just pull everything back and look at it in more detail, especially, you know, Ben, I'm happy you brought up the whole the thing with the influencers and that, you know, and, and companies really trying to bring on these ambassadors and things. And you see it all the time. It's like the next thing in the news that, you know, they found something and you see the slew of tweets where it's like, why didn't you look at this person? So I know I'm always seeing that and I'm like, well, there's shockingly, there is a solution out there, people. So, um, yeah. well, <laughs> It makes sense. I mean, that that's what I meant about my previous probably convoluted comment I made about the world changing so quickly <laughs> right now. You know, it's like so much changed in the past year. Ken and I, we were on our last Christmas trip together. Ken and I did the last trip that mm -hmm. I've been on. Well, I, I've done a few since the pandemic, but the first, you know, like old way of doing business trips. I was in, what, Ken, late February, first week of March, yeah. 2020. Yeah. Something like that. And in any event, like the transformation in even these conversations right now, you guys have been kind enough to invite me on a few of these uh, LinkedIn lives. So now I feel like I'm just used to it of like, this is the way we do business now. Right. But how much has changed? And like, mm -hmm. let's just take a moment and we're so deep in our day to day. Like, let's just take a moment and reflect on, oh my gosh, like yeah. we're in a totally different working market right now and hiring market. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. No, definitely for sure. So a lot of a lot of different things going on, a lot of different trends. But Ken, I want to bump back over to you. So you know, in these specific industries, so tech and entertainment, like we were just talking about, what are some specific trends and other things that you're seeing right now? Yeah, I, I mean, coincidentally, so that we can tell a story that that last business trip was a, a large tech organization, and I, I think what what that really speaks to is. Yeah, you know, not only the, the the last time we got to go to a meeting, but that there was enormous interest in tech before the whole remote yeah. mm -hmm. world even hit us. Yeah, and it, and those meetings have only become more and more involved into the details of what social media screening is. I think at that point it was let's get additional data on a candidate, and now it's become well, how does this broaden our search? that when we are hiring remotely, we really can get an in-depth character of this individual. Uh, so we have seen enormous growth in tech, uh, maybe from that meeting forward. Maybe Ben and I just did such a good job on that, yeah. that meeting. Uh, but but shifting over to uh, the entertainment side, it's critical. We're we're seeing a big investment there in all of our partners, and, and it's not just because they're concerned with the social media 
background of that individual. If you think about it, we deal with a lot of TV networks. We deal with a lot of uh, shows that are traveling around the country. And believe it or not, you've probably seen you know, things like The Little Mermaid. And now you, years later, you understand innuendos that were built in. That companies are very concerned with the, the potential of a producer and what they might mm -hmm. put forth of things that can be, especially with all that's going on with, uh, you know, different government views and different political views. And so it's critical that you have an understanding of the individuals that are creating your content. Mm -hmm. And really that's what it comes down to in the entertainment and media space. And right. that in that space, I would have to say that almost all of our clients are using social media searches in some way uh, to help uncover that additional data point to build that security. W one bad show, one bad event can really take your company from being a top tier business in the entertainment industry to being gone. And so mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not just now about an individual character. It's about building your brand and maintaining that brand. And social media screening is, is one way that you can really ensure that you're doing your due diligence uh, when, when going out there. Yeah, and the, the only thing I would I would add to Ken to what you said, not to be like the the legal wet blanket on, <laughs> on some of this, but you know, you mentioned political affiliation and the challenge when, you know, because I've spoken to some of the shared clients that that you know you're I know that you're referencing right now when you talk about our our, our partnership, they want to see, did you say that racist thing two years ago? Did you act in a threatening way or harassing way to other people earlier this year? Maybe did you talk about our competitive brand online? Did you run a campaign for them? Because, man, if we're, these are not clients that I know of, but if we're Coca-Cola and you did a brand thing with Pepsi, you know, that, that might not be a good fit for us. But what they still don't want to see is they don't want to see, did you vote for Trump? Did you vote for Biden? Did mm -hmm. you, you know, what's your political affiliation? Any company that's going to mix that all together is not doing a good job from a social media screening standpoint. I'll just throw that out there. It's like part of the reason our clients sign up is yes, there's all of this value there, but lingering in the back of our minds are these questions of like, blind me from the political affiliation, mm -hmm. blind me from Democrat, Republican, independent, whatever you want to call it, right? Like there's so many stripes of the rainbow now. Companies want the want the dirt, but they don't want everything else. And I think that's like a really important piece of this is that the Sterling and Fama partnership is one that allows us to deliver these insights in a way that's relevant to the modern consumer, relevant to the you know modern employer, but at the same time protects the employer from seeing things that they shouldn't see. Because at the end of the day, things like political affiliation couldn't matter less to many of our clients. And frankly, it's information that they shouldn't have unless maybe they're a political party themselves and they have a business reason to look at that information, mm -hmm. right? But, or or if know, there's some violence attached to it, right? So if, you know, if, if there is someone who is being violent or threatening, like absolutely right. no question, you know, that that is flaggable under any context. And to me, it makes sense cross board as to why it's done. Um, but I just wanted again to to call out for those in the audience that are like, wait, political? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, he say, so, did so. he say political? Hang on, Ben. Good catch there. Honestly, the and 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 really from a political standpoint, I think I'm talking about you know, photos of somebody charging the Capitol uh, or or such where it, where there's sure. violence involved with the affiliation. Uh, but definitely good good call out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but and but to your point, these are the types of things that w with our uh, integration allow you to customize exactly what you're going to see and what you're not going to see so right. that you are in compliance both with your company guidelines and FCRA. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And yeah, and I, I am happy that part of the conversation did happen organically and it did come up because, you know, being a social media professional myself, this is a topic of conversation that I am seeing within my networks. Now, people are talking about social screening and kind of, you know, seeing 
you know, the people like me take a stance on it and understand it a little bit more is very interesting. But that idea always comes up of, you know, the, the negative stigma almost of like, you can't be looking at my stuff, like you shouldn't be doing that and things like that. But everything that we've spoken about today of where it fits within the hiring process, but then also Ken, what you had just brought up, here's what you're going to see. This is where it makes sense for your organization and everything like that. It is done in a proper way, a compliant way, an ethical way, and everything like that. So again, right. I love how that organically happened on the show today, but I think it's very important that we brought that up for sure. Yeah, and it, it always comes off, I found, this is a ch always a challenge when I talk about this, is like, it always comes off as salesy because we come off as saying like, oh, well, you have to go with the third party because, you, and, and guess who the third party is, you know? And it's always like it does. this question, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's us, it's Sterling Fama. But at the end of the day, like, you can't look at a person's as a hiring manager. You can't do it yourself. You mm -hmm. can't look at, you know, you're absolutely right, Caitlin. Like the things that you're referencing, there's a lot that they shouldn't see. You log on to someone's Facebook. You said they're pregnant. You said they're disabled. You see a political affiliation. You see ethnicity. You can't under the belt. You can't see that information. So using a third party like Sterling mm -hmm. that then routes through a FAMA that, you know, removes all that information from the reports on our client's behalf. That's the... That's the you know happy path to to getting this done and doing it in a way that doesn't you know expose you to legal risk. But it's it's always a challenge because I have to be like giving you real advice, but right. you know there's there's the commercial angle to it too. Yeah. So I always I always struggle with that a little bit. Definitely, for sure. Um, so I do want to remind our audience on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, if you are watching live right now, you can ask questions to both Ken and Ben as we wrap up the show right now. So just go ahead and put any questions you have in the comment section across each of these platforms. Uh, with that being said, I would love to grab some final thoughts from the two of you because I don't have any more questions for you both, but I do want to gather some final thoughts from our conversation. It could be around social screening. It can be around the changing hiring process, remote work, technology, anything the two of you want to leave our audience with. So uh, Ben, I will start with you. Yeah, sure. I, I would say that, you know, social media screening has, has reached a, a peak, I think right now we're continuing to see increasing adoption in terms of our growth. And for those of you that uh, are still thinking about it, still considering, still on the fence, not sure, what will I see? What will I don't see? Can I actually not hire something because of, or someone because of something that I found? How do I set up a pre-adverse action program? What does it look like when the candidate challenges the results? Who handles the dispute? All of those questions are ones that we have answers to and can kind of help you along the way. So all I'd say is we've talked about like the macro shifts in the market that are driving uh, increased adoption of social media screening. and. If anyone would like to talk deeper about, you know, some of the questions or concerns they have, uh, I know Ken and I'd be happy to. So. Awesome. And Ken, final thoughts from you. Yeah, I the I, I think the the biggest takeaway is that uh, when you think about background screening, the landscape and the idea of that has changed so drastically. It it's not really just about finding out if somebody's a criminal or if they. Uh, or have a positive or negative drug test. It is now uh, about casting the widest net and putting a lens on the individuals that you're gonna hire and accessing all of the available data that you can, whether that's social media information, verifications about their past, and using all of this to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Ben said it best, yes, you know, I'm, we're the ones that can provide it. We're, we're, you know, Fama and Sterling, it's a great partnership, but, but it's critical that you look at the broader picture uh, and make a decision on how to keep your organization safe. Absolutely. And I think that was a tremendous way to wrap up the show today. At this time, we don't have any further questions from the audience, but I do want to take this time to thank our audience for joining us live across Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. As a reminder, we do Sterling Live every week, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. We have a great episode lined up for you all next week, so make sure to tune in. And then obviously, thank you to both Ben and Ken. And thank you to me for not getting tongue tied and messing up both of your names throughout the entire show. I <laughs> think I did a great job. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes. yes. So, thanks for hosting us and having us on. I really appreciate uh, Sterling involving FAMA and the many year partnership and for having us on today. So thank you very much. 
Yes, absolutely. And again, thank you both. Thank you to our audience. And we will see you next time.